Hey math students, I had a student, Shelby, who sent me some questions about uh, performing operations with fractions, which is a struggle for a lot of students. So we've got some multiplication problems, some division problems, and some addition subtraction problems. I'm go going to start with multiplication because it's actually easiest. <laughs> fractions were made to multiply and divide, okay? Super simple. So, um, I'm actually going to do this first problem a long way first, just so I can show you why the short way works. And then from there, we'll go ahead and do all the rest the short way. So let's go ahead and take a look. This is 13 tenths times 5 60 fifths. And I'll just remember, remind you that when we're multiplying fractions, that's an act of scaling. So we can actually just multiply straight across the bottom and top, which you guys forget a lot of times because you're so scarred by adding and subtracting fractions where that can't happen that we often forget it can when we're multiplying so before I multiply it out I just want to write it this way 13 times 5 at the top and then 10 times 65 at the bottom now I could multiply that out but I want to write it that way just so I can show you how wonderful um, multiplying fractions will be with canceling because the deal is we know all final fraction answers should be reduced reduced well what is reducing reducing is basically canceling canceling out any common factors so if you have a number on the top and the bottom that are in common you could cancel them and we can see here that 13 times 5 well what if you have 13 and 5 multiplying those are both factors these are factors anything multiplying is a factor and same thing down here, 10 times 65, these are factors. So if I have any factors in common, top and bottom, they'll cancel. Now you might say, Kate, well, I have a 13 and 5 on the top, and I have a 10 and 65 on the bottom. There's nothing in common there. Well, I kind of don't agree, because like I know the number 10 is the same as 2 times 5. A 10 is a 2 times 5. So that means I have a factor of 5 on the top and bottom. And so I could literally cancel those out. So cancel out the 5 on the bottom, divide, or on the top, I'm sorry, in the numerator. Now dividing out the 5 on the bottom, 10 divided by 5 is 2, I'd have a 2 left. And we can keep it up like this. Now here's a, this one is actually a hard example that you gave me, Shelby, because you might not know your 13 times tables, but I know that 13 times 5 is 65. So both this 13 up here is divisible by 13, of course, 13 divided by 13 is 1, but there's also a 13 down here and that's why I can cancel it out. If I divide a 13 out of 65, I get 5. Now on the top, what's left? Well, I canceled everything out, so all I have left is 1's. And on the bottom, 2 times 5 is 10. I get 1 tenth. Now, I said that I was doing it the long way first because I just wanted you to see why it would work. But what's the short way? Well, mathematicians will often just skip all this work. They'll come straight over here and they'll do what's called cross-reducing. Now, cross-reducing only works when you're multiplying. Because when you're multiplying, you're basically putting in factors. Okay, but I can see here I could cross reduce any number from the top with any number from the bottom. So again, these are both the 5 and the 10 are both divisible by 5. So divide out the 5, I get a 1. Divide 5 out of 10, I get a 2. 13 and 65 are both divisible by 13. Divide out of 13, I get a 1. Divide out of 13, I get a 5. And I can see sweep across the top to multiply. 1 times 1 is 1, and 2 times 5 is 10. So the short way to multiply fractions is to cross reduce first. and then multiply straight across numerator times numerator and denominator times denominator. And again, this is for multiplying fractions. And why are we allowed to multiply straight across? Because multiplication is an act of scaling, of scaling, so it can change size. Okay, so let's take a look at this bottom example here. Now that I know that I can reduce before I even start, take a look at this. Look at this nine on the bottom, 9 on the top. That's a common factor of 9. It's just going to cancel out and go to 1. Now 7 and 10 don't have anything in common. I know because 7 is a prime number, and of course I can't divide 10 by 7. And so I'm just going to multiply straight across 7 over 10. Now you might be wondering what to do with the negatives. That's a totally separate rule. Please remember when multiplying and dividing, two negatives cancel. That is the rule for multiplying and dividing. Okay, and so I will end up a negative and a negative will turn into a positive, and I do get positive 7 tenths here. Okay, so 
there's two pretty simple multiplication problems, but let's look at an application of that. So um, you had a couple of area problems. Well, I noticed an area of a triangle, and then you had this rectangle problem that you sent me, Shelby, and you didn't give me the directions, but I do assume that it said find the area of the rectangle. Um, I hope it did. If not, you can resend it to me, but let's go ahead and take a look at to this problem here. If I were going to find the area of a rectangle, well, the GED formula sheet or probably your homework um, directions probably tell you that to find the area of a rectangle, multiply together the length and the width. And that's what makes this, even though it doesn't look like it, a multiplication problem. Because my length here is 8 39ths of a foot. My width is 1 8th of a foot. And now this is just a multiplication problem. Since it's a multiplication problem, I can cross reduce. Those are both divisible by 8. And then multiply straight across. And I get that the area would be 1 39th of a square foot. Why a square foot? Because it's a measure of area. Great. Okay, now let's look at the area of the triangle. A little bit trickier of a problem. They were kind to you, though. They did give you the formula. And if anybody was doing this on the GED, you would have the formula. They would tell you that the area is equal to 1 half of the um, base times the height. That's the area of a triangle formula. Okay, so I'm going to have a 1 half that I'm multiplying with. And then my base here, a base is the side that's perpendicular to, so it goes at a right angle to, the height of the rectangle. So my base is 1 and 3 quarters. And my height is 4 ninths. Now, you can see that I have three numbers multiplying. This one, 1 half, is a pure fraction, yay. This one, 4 ninths, is a pure fraction, yay. But I got a problem with this number. 1 and 3 fourths is not a pure fraction, and so it will not multiply gorgeously like a pure fraction does. We actually like fractions for multiplying much better than um, mixed numbers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a pure fraction or an improper fraction. So it's one whole thing, one whole thing, and three quarters, one, two, three. Uh, so if I were to count that up, that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven quarters. I converted that into an improper fraction. And now I can do all my multiplying. Okay, now the super nice thing is even when you're multiplying three fractions, you can still cancel the same number top and bottom. So like four and a four, Cancel, and let's see, I got a 2 down here, but I have nothing up on top that'll cancel with a 2. I have the same thing here, I've got a 7 up here, but nothing down there that'll cancel with a 7. 9 down here, but nothing up there that'll cancel with a 9. And so I'm going to multiply straight across, I get 7 eighteenths. So it'd be 7 eighteenths of a square yard. Again, why a square yard? Uh, because I was finding the area of a triangle. Area is always measured in square units. Um, and there you go, that's the answer there. All right, so we got um, all our multiplying done. So now that we've multiplied, I think that we ought to be able to uh, link that to division. Multiplication and division are the same thing in opposite uh, directions, and so we ought to be able to pull out some of the same rules. Now, I want to start with this first one to talk a little bit about what it means to divide. Even if you knew nothing about fractions, I argue that you probably still could have done 6 divided by 1 fifth if you thought about the meaning of division. So what I'm saying here is take 6 whole things, and then make groups. Remember when you're dividing, this tells you the groups of 1 fifth. Basically, I'm saying how many one-fifths are inside of six whole things? Well, let's take six whole things. There's six whole things. That's what I'm supposed to be starting with. And then I'm supposed to be dividing it into groups of one-fifth. Okay, well, let's break everything into fifths. So let's break this guy into fifths. I break that one whole thing into fifths. I end up with five-fifths. Now let's break this guy into fifths. Now I got ten-fifths. Fifteen-fifths. There's... Uh, 20 fifths, 25 fifths, and 30 fifths. So obviously I need to get 30. There were 30 fifths inside of six whole things. In six whole things I can get out 30 fifths. Um, weird. Okay, I just did that with the division uh, or the definition of division. Well, how would you do it with an algorithm? Like what if I couldn't draw a picture? What should I do? Well, think about what you did. Every time you took one whole thing 
and divided it by five, you ended up cutting it, cutting it into five pieces. And we said five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. It's a lot like we were actually multiplying by five. And in fact, we were. So let's go ahead and rewrite this division problem as a multiplication problem. Turns out you can rewrite division as a multiplication. And here's the thing your college teacher probably made you memorize. They probably told you that um, dividing by a fraction So like this problem, it says divided by one fifth, so I was dividing by a fraction, is equivalent to, it's equal to, it's the same as multiplying by that fraction's reciprocal. And a reciprocal is a fancy word of saying flip. So here's how your teacher probably did it in class. Probably they didn't draw diagrams like I did, but they said six divided by one fifth is the same as um, taking six and instead of dividing, multiplying by instead of using one fifth, using the flip or the reciprocal of one fifth. The opposite or flip of one fifth is five over one. See how I flipped up the numerator um, to be the denominator and the denominator to be the numerator. Now that being said, you should know that anything over one is just a whole number. So five over one is just five. And of course, six times five is 30. So I don't care if you prove it to me with a picture or mathematically, we would still get 30. But I'm gonna use this mathematical rule, dividing by a fraction is equivalent to multiplying by the fractions reciprocal to turn all of my division problems into multiplication. So let's take a look at this next one. It says 1 6 divided by negative 11 21sts. So I will use that rule and I often shortcut myself to remember it as keep it, keep the first number the same, don't do anything to it. Change it, change the division into multiplication and flip it. Use the fractions reciprocal. So it'll be 1 6, so I'm gonna keep the first number times, I'm gonna change division into multiplication, negative 21 over 11. So I flipped the fraction on its head and obviously nothing happens to the negative when you flip. And now it's a division problem, I mean it's a multiplication problem. So now I can treat it like a multiplication problem. I can cross reduce and multiply straight across. Okay, so it might not be obvious to you, but I happen to know that both six and 21 are on the three times tables. They're both divisible by three. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna divide them both by three. Six divided by three is two, and 21 divided by three is seven. I don't see anything else with anything in common, so I'm gonna go ahead and multiply straight across the top. One times seven is seven. Straight across the bottom, two times 11 is 22, and then I'll consider signs. I said that when there were two negatives in a multiplication or division problem, they canceled, but I don't have two negatives, I only have one, so it'll stick around. Negative seven twenty seconds is my answer. All right, so we covered multiplication and division. Now, like I said, fractions were born to multiply and divide. Not hard at all, but where do fractions get tricky? Adding and subtracting fractions gets a little tricky, so let's look at that. Okay, so you have this problem with addition and subtraction of fractions, and here's the deal. Since the beginning of math, we've only ever been able to add and subtract the same kind of things. I'll give you a great example. Back in second grade, we were making you, you know, say, well, four, what is four apples plus two apples? And you guys would tell me, okay, that's six apples, super easy. But now I want you to think about this. What's four apples plus two oranges? I ask my students this all the time in the first, very first day of class, I'll ask them, what's four apples plus two oranges? And um, I get one of two answers and they're both right, okay? Some people will tell me, well, it's four apples and two oranges. And I agree. It'd be nonsense to talk about apple oranges. You would never tell me, oh, it's six apple oranges. That just doesn't even make sense. You would say, well, what is four apples and two oranges? It's just four apples and two oranges. Or sometimes students say, well, Kate, they're both fruit. So I'll ask them, what is four apples and two oranges? And they'll say, oh, that's six pieces of fruit. And it was interesting, as soon as they gave them the same name, as soon as they said, oh, that's both fruit, they were able to add it. So I have the same problem here. I cannot add and subtract because I don't have the same kinds of things. Let's look at what I have. I have one fourth. I have one thing of size fourth. I have one 
12. I have one thing of size 12. And I have one eighth. I have one thing of size eighth. They're not the same kinds of things. I have fourths, twelfths, eighths. I can't add and subtract these currently. However, with fractions, I do have the power to force them to be the same kinds of things. Because we could take something, for example, that was cut into four pieces. So this is a picture of one fourth. And you could just keep cutting it up. For example, I could cut it this way, boom, boom. And then one fourth would be the same as two eighths. Or I could take this, again, this is one fourth, um, and I could cut it a little differently. I could cut them each into three more pieces here. And then one fourths would turn into three twelfths. So the idea is um, we have lots of equivalent fractions. We're gonna use that to force these three things to be the same kind of thing. So you might think, well, how many pieces could I cut them all into? Well, what you gotta do is you gotta figure out where four, 12, and eight run into each other on their times tables. Now. Your teacher probably called that the least common denominator, but it's the first time the three numbers run into each other on their times tables. So let's check it out. Now, uh, let's start with uh, four. Four, eight, 12. It looks like it contains those numbers, okay? But I want all three numbers on this, uh, you know, all three lists to have the same number. So let's see. After eight, if I were to count by eights, I'd get 16 and then 24. Ah, that's looking good, because I know when I count by 12s, I can get to 24. And when I count by 4s, I can get to 24. 24 is the first number that they all share. So 24 is the way that I could force them all to be the same size. What I want is I want them all to have a bottom size of 24, a denominator of 24. Okay, let's think about if I had fourths. If I had fourths and I wanted to get it to be 24 pieces, well, I'd have to take those fourths and then I'd have to cut each one into six pieces. Six, 12, 18, 24. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both the top and the bottom by six. Super important that you do it on both the top and the bottom because you're gonna slice up everything. Um, and I would get six over 24. One fourth is equivalent to six over 24. Good, I'm gonna cross this off. Now let's think about if I already had something that was cut into 12s. Well, if I had one 12 and I wanted to get to 24, I would just have to slice each piece into two because two times 12 is 24. So now multiply the top by two as well and I get two 24ths. One 12th is the same as two 24ths. If I had something of size eighth and I wanted to get it to 24, so I'd have to slice it into three pieces each. Eight times three is 24. And then on the top, one times three is three. And now, now that all these numbers are 24 fourths, now I can add and subtract them. So I've got six of something and I take away two of that same kind of thing. Well, now I'll have four of that thing, 24 fourths. I've got four of something and then I'll go ahead and add three more of that same something. I'll have seven of that kind of something. I'll have seven 24 fourths. Now the final thing you're supposed to do when you're adding and subtracting fractions is to reduce, but I happen to know that seven is a prime number. There's nothing I can divide him by except for one and seven. And if I look at 24, 24 doesn't divide by seven. I am done. All right, so one more problem. Nope, no more problems, I lied. That was all you asked for. All right, Shelby, I hope that helps. Um, good luck. Um, Adding and subtracting fractions, don't feel bad, is a challenging topic for most students because it's just got a lot of skills within it. Um, but I have great faith in you. Let me know if you need any more help. And if any of the rest of you have any questions, drop them in the comments.